Välkomna till Se människans scenen. Här pågår det författar- och litteratursamtal. Nu är temat när vår frihet blir andras ofrihet. Ärkebiskop Antje Jacqueline samtalar med den brittiske filosofen Raul Martinez. Och det här samtalet sker på engelska. Varsågoda. Tack. Welcome Raul Martinez to see Manishan. Uh, you are an artist. Actually, your specialty is portraits. That's right. You yep. have quite an achievement in that. And tell me, how does a young man, a young artist, embark on an endeavor to write such a thick book on freedom? Is this a portrait of freedom? In some sense, it is a portrait of freedom. Um, it attempts to look at our society through this lens, and I think freedom is a very powerful lens to look at our society. So many aspects of our civilization, from free markets, free elections, to free media, are characterized and almost sold to us in terms of this virtue of freedom. Um, but why did I get drawn to it? I think I can trace it back to almost one conversation I had when I was a teenager. I was 13 years old at the time, and I was walking home from school and I was having a debate with a friend of mine. Now, my friend was very religious and I wasn't religious, and we were having a debate about religion, as many young people do. And it seemed to me there was something arbitrary about his belief, and I wanted to impress this point upon him. And a thought experiment popped into my head. And so I said to him, my friend, imagine that you were born in another family and you were raised into another faith. Don't you think that now you'd be defending with the same passion that religious system instead of your current one? Now, at the time, I thought this was a killer argument, and yet it had no impact on my friend whatsoever. <laughs> mm. But walking home that night, I realized the very same reasoning applied to me, that had I been born in a different family, had I been raised in a different culture and presented and exposed to different norms and morality and, uh, and values, I would be a very different person. And it slowly dawned on me that everything about who I was, from the way I looked, my physical appearance, to my belief system, the way that I saw the world, what I regarded as normal, and all the rest of it, it could all be traced, ultimately, to my genetic inheritance and the environment that I'd been exposed to. So my identity had been created by forces that I didn't control. So for me, this was a revelation. I found it a very scary idea, but also a very exciting one. And it set me on a journey of exploration to try and understand the limits and scope of our freedom as human beings. Mm -hmm. And that has a personal component. What freedom do we have as individuals? but also very much a political one. And I think these two things are closely intertwined. Mm, that's exciting. Except for the, that was very well done for 13 year olds, I think. And I think you're right about the importance of asking these questions. Mm. But I think you're not right about that too many young people actually do this. That too few people ah. who ask these big questions nowadays. So good for you. Um, but then you come up with this pretty comprehensive portrait of freedom. And it isn't a totally beautiful portrait of freedom, isn't it? Well, for me, the point of looking at the limitations of freedom, it's not simply to kind of wallow in our helplessness or, 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 or these external limits. I think the whole idea of the book is that the more we understand our limits, the better placed we are to transcend them. So the book really wants to say, look, we have less freedom than we like to think. But if we can acknowledge that, and if we can confront it, and if that knowledge then informs our society, we can actually enhance the freedom that is available to us. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I think it's quite dangerous the way that freedom is used and conceptualized in our society. It's almost a mask on a rather unjust, destructive system. The, the appearance of freedom, but behind that appearance, we see the opposite quite often. Mm -hmm. But let me press a little further on yeah. this. Um, I mean, you said what forms us is genes and environment. I mean, nature and nurture, that's nothing new. So no. what's new about your book then? 
So the whole nature and nurture debate is beside the point for me. Because the nature and nurture debate is about how much one or the other factor influences who we are. What I say is, it doesn't matter. What matters is that we control neither of those factors. We are in control neither of the nature dimension of our identity or the nurture. Um, and so for this reason, our traditional notion of freedom and responsibility is erroneous. I would say it has no empirical or intellectual basis. Um, so let me try and explain that a bit clearer. Mm. We all make choices. This is what people like to say. And often in the Q&A, people put their hands up and go, yeah, but we all make choices. And the, the truth is, of course we all make choices. But we make choices with a brain that we didn't choose. Um, so think of a serial killer. A serial killer will make many horrendous choices, but they won't include choosing the brain of a serial killer. So the, no the traditional notion of responsibility, I think, is highly problematic. But wait a moment. You don't inherit the ready-made brain of a serious killer. No, you don't. You don't. Um, but that brain hasn't been created by the individual. That brain is a product of a very complex interaction between society and the environment and your biological inheritance. So when you draw a portrait and you pick up your brush mm. and you choose among the colors, what is your freedom in that moment? The freedom that we all have, and it's an extremely important form of freedom, is to act in accordance with our beliefs and our values. And over time, to change ourselves. We can learn new things and we can learn from mistakes. This is extremely important and, uh, and it's the essence of the freedom that is available to us. But what we don't do is make choices in a sense that make us truly responsible for those choices, those decisions. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, some people like to say, look, I accept your argument when we're talking about children, but surely as we develop, uh, and our cognitive faculties strengthen, we acquire responsibility. But the problem with that is that by the time we have the capacity to question our own identity, we're very much in possession of one. And so, although we can choose to change the way in which we want to change, and our success in making that change will be determined by how we are already as a result of genes and experience. So there's room for some very valuable aspects of liberty, of learning, mm -hmm of choosing in accordance with our identity, but not for deep responsibility for who we are, mm -hmm. because who we are is a product of forces we don't control. Mm -hmm. Did you choose portrait uh, painting as your expertise? Because that is an expression of your philosophy, of saying, well, you can't change the face that you are portraying, but still the act of creating a portrait is a very creative act. So I'm still like looking for where do you lodge the moment of creative freedom in that process? I think the best we can do, I mean, just a word on the portrait painting, is some I just love to draw as a kid. I love to draw, I love to paint, I love the meditative state that it put me in. So I would sit for hours on end, um, exploring my imagination and observing. And over time, that became a very welcome balance to the intellectual work, um, becoming a philosopher, researching, looking for the science, and ultimately writing. So for me, they're kind of, it's a nice complementarity. Um, but where is the freedom? I think the closest we can get to expanding our freedom is to question our identity. I think it's highly dangerous to simply accept the identity that chance has delivered to us. Um, this is how prejudice and ignorance get transferred from one generation to the next if people don't interrogate the basis of their identity. So I think for democracy to function and also simply for individual liberty to be meaningful, we have to examine every aspect of our identity. We have to create some emotional distance between the identity we've inherited and our rational capacity to look at that identity. Do you think and reflect that on identity it. is essentially something static? No, absolutely that you not. The identity we have inherited, mm. you use kind of a language that makes me feel that, okay, this is something that is almost deterministic and we need to question it. I would rather say um, 
as long as we are human beings, we are all always in search of identity, and that is exactly as it should be. Well, that's the journey I'm talking about, is that we expand our freedom by questioning the basis of our identity. By trying to understand the forces that created us, we learn more about the self. So it, it's almost paradoxical that self-knowledge takes you very quickly into an investigation of the outside world, into the systems that have shaped you, from the education system, the media system, to capitalism itself and the values and logics inherent in it. Mm. So that's what happened with me. I was very concerned as a teenager on realizing this to maximize my liberty. Mm. And I began to want to understand the way that my society worked. Why had I been raised to think in this particular way mm. and not this particular way? Uh, and okay, this is this makes us very much focusing on our individuality, which is part of who we are, of course. Yes. But if you take s if we take seriously that we as human beings are relational human beings yes. with relationships to ourselves, but also to each other, uh, to nature, yeah. to God, yeah. or the transcendent, or whatever we call yeah. it, yeah. Um, to our individual and communal past to our individual and communal future. How do you figure in all this? Well, there's a very direct link. If we are not the true authors of our own identity, then the question arises, who is? And in every society, you can observe a pattern that there are aspects of people's identity that exist, not because they serve the people themselves, but because they serve those who have the power to shape those identities. So, for example, you go back a few centuries to when monarchs ruled Europe. It was highly convenient to spread the notion of the divine right of king. Right? If you're king, that's a great belief to infuse I I into um, the populace. Well, we, seem that we see today similar dynamics, that for the current system to function as it is, there are very convenient beliefs which are spread about economics, about the nature of capitalism, about the nature of inequality. And this is when I began to realize that the question of how responsible we are is a highly, highly political one. It's not simply a topic for philosophical seminars. It lies at the heart of, I would say, the debate on right-wing and left-wing political ideology. The right-wing wants to say, everyone is where they should be. Those at the top of society are there because they deserve to be there. They, are, they have qualities that we should emulate. And those at the bottom, those are homeless, living on the street. It's unfortunate, but they've made bad decisions, and they're responsible too for those decisions. That is a way of upholding the right-wing philosophy. I think as you move towards the left, you get a very different conception, and I want to push it very far towards the left and actually say no one is truly responsible for their identity or ultimately what they do and their life outcomes. And so as a society, we need to share collectively the responsibility for all of the outcomes that we see. If we get the cordon of responsibility and we tie it tightly around the indi individual, what that does is it blinds us to the deeper causal factors. And those deeper causal factors are crucial. They, they, they include how much inequality you have in society. They include the cultural norms, the way the media functions, what history is taught in school, um, all those aspects. And that's really where I go in after the first part of the book. That's really the direction I go in to explore. Mm. Well, uh, how, how, what does it mean for how we uh, should relate, uh, talk about evil, address evil, and even fight against evil? It's a very good question. And some people get quite worried with this philosophy because they think, hang on a minute. If you question the notion of responsibility, are you not questioning the foundation of morality? I would say the very opposite is the case. That two wonderful things follow on from this philosophy. The first is more humility. Because if I don't believe I'm truly responsible for my identity and the opportunities that I have, I cannot legitimately feel entitled to my privilege. If I have more luck than someone else, I have to acknowledge it's not because I've earned it, I don't deserve it. And this leads to humility. And then when you switch that around and you look at other people, what it does is it enhances compassion, which is the second consequence, I think, of this philosophy. That even when people do things which you find troublesome, 
even when people behave in terrible ways, you absolutely condemn the behavior, but you have compassion for the individual. Because you understand that had I been in their position, had I had their genes and their environment, I would have their brain and I'd be behaving in that way too. And so you end up with a much more, you move away from retribution as a kind of solution to bad behavior and towards rehabilitation and also looking at the root causes mm. of behavior. And I think that's a much more enlightened approach and also a much more effective uh, approach. Yeah, from, from that, I, it's, I think it's not chance that your book ends with a chapter on empathy. Mm. Uh, but yet is empathy, empathy is a great thing, but is it enough to change the world? Is it enough in a time of climate crisis? No. No. So what else do we do? Do we need? We need collective action. This is a big question. How long but have we how got? How do we get collective action <laughs> All right, out we've got of like this? Three minutes. But I'm <laughs> going to tell you what I think we need to do. Four minutes. <laughs> Four minutes. Okay. Um, I mean, really, I think we need to have a sense of deep causality. A lot of what I'm talking about is the difference between shallow causality and deep causality. Do we try and look at the deeper roots of the problems that we see, or do we just simply blame it on one individual or one society or whatever? Now, when you look at the climate challenge and the failing of the international economic order, you have to trace those roots back to the dominant global paradigm, which is capitalism. Now, historically, capitalism has two unfortunate tendencies, and we've seen this over the last 200 years. The first tendency is to concentrate wealth over time. This is uncontroversial. There's numerous studies. You can talk all about them, but it concentrates wealth over time. The only thing that prevents capitalism from concentrating wealth is the reach of democracy. The second unhelpful um, tendency is to expand in scale over time. Mm. And not only does this happen, we celebrate it in our society, and we measure it with the GDP metric. And in fact, we do everything we can to accelerate the rate at which capitalism expands. Now, both of these tendencies are absolutely toxic at this moment in history. The only way we have a chance of solving or addressing the ecological crisis is to construct a system which does the opposite, which redistributes wealth globally and domestically um, between the global north and the global south, and contracts in scale. We need actually a smaller system. Um, there's, mu there's lots and lots of science behind this. It's been very well worked out, but it, it's very inconvenient because what it does is it challenges the center ground of political opinion, the established view of the world. Mm -hmm. But wha what I've come to believe is that the center ground of political opinion, opinion is not where extremes are avoided, it's where they're normalized. And we need to reject this extreme and say, we have a choice confronting us, and it's a very stark choice, and it's a choice between life, protecting life, or protecting capitalism. We can't have both at this point. Mm -hmm. um, it's extremely serious, and I, I would say we need to organize collectively to bring about mm -hmm. the system which contracts in scale and shares as well. I was wondering, um, what about the notion of gift, the gift, which plays a major role in, uh, of course, postmodern philosophy, mm. but also a major role in theology, not least in the Lutheran tradition, which mm. I represent, yep. where it said uh, that freedom, mm. liberation, comes by grace. It's a gift. Mm. We say liberated by grace to um, love and serve our neighbor. Mm. How would you relate to that, re that notion? I think it's a wonderful notion. I think the key, the key element that I want to highlight when talking about the gift element and also empathy is where do we draw the boundaries between us, those who are regarded as neighbors, and those who aren't? Because that, for me, is a crucial question facing us in the coming decades. Who counts as our neighbor? Mm. Is it people within the boundary of our country, the borders of our country? Is it people who look like us or sound like us or speak our language? Or actually, is it every human being or every living thing on the planet? Mm -hmm. I really think to have a chance of moving forward and enhancing what freedom is available to us, we need to cultivate a global identity. Jesus answered that one in the parable of the uh, merciful Samaritan. Right. Where the question is turned around, not mm -hmm. who is my neighbor, mm -hmm. but to whom do I become a neighbor? Yeah. And I guess the one who has fallen into the hand of the robbers lying there, today there is not only human beings, that's also ecosystems. Yeah, 
Exactly, ecosystems too. Absolutely fundamental. Well, thank you for a great conversation. Well, thank you. <laughs> Time it, is out. it went quickly. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much.